Um, I'm actually uh, not going to be talking about visualization. I, I've done that, and this is actually much more important, I think. Visualization is a byproduct of what I'm about to talk about. And, um, you know, I am, I am, uh, I'm one of the, I am, I'm the anti-PhD dude here. I am, I have, uh, you know, I was one of those, one of those kids, where are you? It, <laughs> following you is going to be really hard. You're, you're amazing. Um, but the, the energy alone is. But the, the, uh, I was one of those kids in high school who, uh, you know, the, most of those kids are dropping out, not because they can't do the work, but because they, they, uh, they don't see the relevance of what they're learning to their future, to their adult selves. I was certainly one of those people. I went to four high schools in four states. I, I, you know, I, I, even one of the most innovative high schools in America, the Cherry Creek High School outside of Denver. And I basically, uh, I never went to college. I just dropped out. And, I mean, I finished school, and that was it. I was done. I, I had no idea what to do with myself. So I, I started this journey of invention and reinvention and sort of experimentation with my life. And I, I've, I've gone a lot of different places. I've made a lot of bad mistakes. I've made a lot of, I've failed a lot. But I've also succeeded, and I feel like I've, I've lived pretty, a pretty good life that, that has been mostly m my life. Which, so what I want to talk to you about is, is our lives. You know, That's what I'm going to talk to you about. So I teach a class at Michigan State University on, that you know, I call my unlearning class. You know, it's, it's a class in the creative process, but I call it an unlearning class because even at 20 years old, these students are completely certain that they are, they, they, have, they have this, you know, this, this block of concrete that says they've etched onto it what they can and cannot do and what they, uh, you know, and, and basically they define themselves as non-creatives. They all define themselves as non-creatives. And this is the creative process class. And that's completely wrong. They are completely wrong. Creativity, you know, they, if you ask any of us, most of us are going to say, you know, I'm not creative. My sister's the creative one. You know, you want to go talk to my sister. She, look at that muumuu she's wearing and look at that paint in her, in her ear. Or if you're at work, it's like, oh, don't ask me to solve this. You want to talk to Ed. And check out those candy cane socks when you see Ed. I mean, he's the creative one at this company. I mean, Ed, go talk to Ed. Thanks. Bye. You know, we live in fear that we're going to be asked to do things that we're just not, that are not etched on that concrete block. So one of the first exercises I, exercises I do with these students is I, I have them write down in a journal everything that's going on in their current lives. Everything. Five minute, right, you know, five minute, five minute time limit, and they all just start, you know, scribbling away and pages, you know. And I looked at those journals after they turned them in, and what I saw was a bunch of very routine stuff, you know, left brain, you know, I'm, I want to get my master's, I, uh, I, live, I live in a dorm, uh, this is my major, um, and it was actually not very, they were not very nice to themselves. They were sort of, you know, kind of, you know, it's almost like they, they're not allowed to boast. So they, they would pick on what they can't do, what they you know, what wish they did better, and all these kinds of things, what they're thinking. They tried to get into what they were thinking. Oh, I wish I could do this better. Then the second part of this exercise was kind of dangerous. Um, I decided that they had to become self-explorers. They had to go inside. And they had to go deep. And it had to be real. And the only way I could think of to do that was to take 300 students, it's a pretty big class, on a deep meditation. And I am not a groovy guy. When I'm from San Francisco and California, I mean, all my friends are all being groovy, you know, listening to Ravi Shankar, you know, groovy. And I wanted just my cigarettes and vodka tonic, you know, and I moved to New York, you know. So I, I'm not the groovy guy in the group. I never have been. But my, 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 I, just, I had done this before because of something else, that, an experience I had. And I thought, you know, this, this might work with these students to go deep, you know, become deep explorers like undersea. And so, you know, lights came down, everybody relaxed. This is a huge auditorium. And everybody get comfortable, kick off your shoes, you know, deep breathing, all of that stuff, you know, to just get them to a place where they felt safe. The whole class, the whole goal, goal of my class was to make people feel safe, that they could fail, screw up, take chances, take risks, not be too embarrassed. If they're not going to be any more embarrassed than the person next to them. And that was my whole goal with this class. And by, and by doing absolutely ridiculously stupid things like this, it sort of got to get the message that this is going to be a different kind of class. And so I took them deep. And they basically became this, you know, I, one guy fell asleep right there. <laughs> you know, guys will do that, you know. And there were the, all the guys like, I don't do this. You know, they were like, I'm not doing this. And that was fine. You know, they don't want to know. People, people don't like turning their eyeballs inward. We like to distract ourselves. We don't like turn, you know, like this. Not good. So 
I sort of told them to listen to what I was saying and, and took them on this journey and basically eventually got around to the, yes, you're in your head. We've been thinking in a very slow way of all of these things. And guess who's in there with you? Your, your little six-year-old self is in there. They all have their eyes closed. There was this ripple that kind of went through the room of their bodies. And they were basically, I told them it was a good day. You're seeing yourself at six or five years old. There you are. Maybe you're, it's a good day. You're happy. You're, maybe you're on your tricycle on the sidewalk. Maybe you're baking something. Maybe you're on the playground in recess. Whatever you're doing. And they know you're there too. So I want you to go up to that little kid that you used to be, and I want you to tell them whatever it is you'd like to tell them, what they, you feel they'd like to know about how it all turned out. And so it was not a comfortable exercise. You know? um, and I, I later went to the journals and looked at those two pages, and what a change. Exact same exercise, five minutes, everything you're thinking about, about your life right now. And what they said was amazing stuff. The, it was forgiving, it was loving, it was nurturing, it was embracing, it was frustrated, it was sad. And I, was, I realized that I touched on a nerve and I thought, yeah, okay, so, because part of the creative process, part of contributing to this planet is knowing that you're the one doing the contributing. You, inside who you are. And it's really hard for us to find that. And so, what we do is we become, well, actually, I did this workshop in another, just to, to, uh, in another place with once before with a smaller group of adults, which is why I knew it kind of worked. And it was basically, they, this woman came up to me afterwards and she said, can I tell you what I told myself when I was a kid? What she said to her little five-year-old self. And I said, sure, what'd you say? And she said, um, I, I said I was sorry because of the way it had all turned out. She was 38 and it just wasn't, what she'd always thought it would be. Because kids are, they're, kids are amazing. Kids are just exploratory. They're just, you know, the whole world is their oyster. They don't know the word failure. It's not even in the their vocabulary until we put it there. And so what happens is kids change. What happens between the kid and the 38-year-old, or the 20-year-old, or the 15 or the, what happens? Life happens is what happens. They start to recognize right away that conformity is rewarded. Being like everyone else and getting along is the way to be in this world. And that's not a bad thing. It's human nature to be that way. That's never going to change. We ha we're a society that has to get along. You need order and structure and all of that stuff. But somehow along the way, we've completely lost ourselves in all of this. And, you know, if we're, and if we go against the grain, we're punished. You're not a team player. You know, we spend all this time pleasing our parents, our friends, our bosses, our, our teachers. My students just want to know, tell me how to get an A in this class. What do I, just tell me what I got to do. And it's like, I don't know what you got to do, you know? <laughs> and let's talk about that word, you. Who is you? Is you the compilation of, is, is your brain a sticky, muddled, cobwebby mess of everyone else's expectations? Is that who you are? Who are we asking? Are you saying your parents told me to ask that? What do, you, what do you mean, what's success? I don't know how to define that. So we basically learn to be happy in a very conformist world. Now, that's fine. It's good to be happy. You know, I've got my, I'm happy. I've got my corner office. I've got my family. People like me. I have, no one's pissed off at me that I know, which is, been a good long stretch. <laughs> and, it, and I know that's going to end and it's going to really upset me. I hate for people to be mad at me. But we don't like those eyeballs turned inward, so we turn them out. We start to look for meaning in other ways in our lives. Because we're sort of, despite the fact that we're happy, this conformity leads to enormous frustration. This country is depressed. There are a lot of people on antidepressants. There are things just not going well for some people. So we look for meaning in other things. We, you know, if we're religious, we become ultra-religious, and we look, at, we look for that. We look for food. We look for all sorts of ways to just give more meaning and, and to comfort ourselves for, for, for the sadness we're feeling about 
I'm so sorry that it didn't turn out so well the way that I intended when I was five. Because that five-year-old is still in there, right? So, so, you know, what do you do about all of this? You know, what do you do about all of this? It's, um, you got to take care of yourself. I know that's a cliche. But you've got to become an explorer of you. You've got to turn those eyeballs inward, if you care. Because what you want to be able to do in this life is you want to, we're all contributors externally to our lives, but, but it's not, the question is who is really doing the contributing? Who's doing the, 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 the who's really doing this? And so what you want to be able to do is make sure that you're, you're contributing something of pure value that is unique to you, that is your contribution, not the amalgamation of all these people who are telling you what to think. So you want to try and find that, that person in there who, who you are. You want to clear out the cobwebs. So one of the things you can do is um, go in and go deep. Become an, be, become an explorer of, of you. And that's not an easy thing to do, you know, as I've said. So you have to think of your life sort of, think of, think, if you take care of yourself, you're going to be much better suited. You're going to be stronger, more powerful, and much more anchored to take care of the people and, and, your, and, and your, your job, all the things around you. If you're this muddled mess of doubt and self-loathing, I hate to say that, but you know, some of us are, not all of us, some of you are doing great, but it's basically, <laughs> there's that one guy up in the corner who's going, not me. You know, but you know, what, what, and there, I'm getting to a point about creativity. This is all about creativity, the creative process, what I'm talking about. It's not about picking on anybody, because I've been exploring my whole life and, you know, but um, now I've totally forgotten where I was going with this. Um, yeah, it's like an oxygen mask on an airplane. You've heard the metaphor a million times, you know, drops down, put it on your face first, then put it on your child. Because if you're passed out or dead, you're no, you're no help to that kid at all. So you take this person you are into your home life. What is the message you're sending to your children? You're saying, be like me and get along. Because you're doing it to protect them. You're doing it to help them. You want them to get along. It's hard not to get along in this world. It's hard to, nobody's telling you to stand out and be a jerk and weirdo. Hey, that guy's the weirdo. Forget candy cane and socks. That guy's really weird because he does his own thing. I'm not saying that. You have to get along. But you, in the house, in the home, there's a balance that you can strike. Where you're, you're, you're saying, this is the way it is. You've got to get along. But listen, you've got to find your own voice in all of this. And you've got to sort of, you know, grow into you, and this is, these are the boundaries that society has, but be you. And so you can create a nurturing relation, you know, home life that, that fosters individuality and rewards failure, risk and experimentation. Take that into the job place. Okay, so here you're all happy, right? You're up in your corner office, and you're happy. I got, my, I got, I got the corner freaking office. And I got, I got like, you know, Ed down the hall with the candy cane socks. He's my buffer to make me look good or to take the heat off me because he comes up with all the creative solutions that are required in this company. I'm not asked to do anything. Then your boss comes some, one day and says, hey, I'd like, to, I'd like you to come into my, my office, into the, into the, in the room where I'm calling in all the, the department heads. We have a big problem we need to solve. And you go, no problem, you know, this ought to be 20 minutes, lunch. You get in there, candy cane man's not there. Buffer gone. He's going to look for me. So he says, Carl, what do you think we ought to do here? This is called brainstorming. Anybody have any ideas? What do we do? And everybody's trembling. Because there was a study that came out years and years ago that said 7 out of 10 Americans are feel inadequate at what they're doing and are going to be discovered at any minute. They're going to be, like, exposed. <laughs> And I am certainly one of those. It's never stopped me from doing anything, because I'm never the most intelligent person in the room, but I'm often the most enthusiastic person in the room. <laughs> and that, can, that counts for a lot sometimes. <laughs> You've been leaning on that a long time. But it's, you know, so, so here you are sitting there feeling completely 7 out of 10. And it's like, this is not good. This is not good. The finger's pointed right at you. What are you going to do? Oh, Christ, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, so you're looking around. Anybody ideas? So what you start doing is you start regurgitating patterned ways of thinking that are predictable, expected, and not very surprising. 
the way the brain works is it, it likes to be safe. The, 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 the brain does not like to be uncomfortable. The brain likes to be safe. So what it does is when it, it gets input, it responds a certain way based on that input. Patterns. This, if then, if then, if then. An example of that was Colgate. Um, maybe it was Crest, but a major toothpaste company years ago, again, wanted to sell more toothpaste. So I asked my 300 students, so what do you, what do you think they did? What do you think they did? 20 hands went up. They lowered prices. They threw more money at advertising. All these very predictable advertising. It's a lot of my students are advertising, although it's a journalism class. Oh, no, it's not. It's a, ca it's a college class. And so all these, you know, a lot of predictable thinking. And I said, no, that's not what they did. They did just guess what they did. If anybody can guess, the pizza's on me. So all hands go off. They'll guess anything if pizza's free. <laughs> They'll guess anything. It's ridiculous. Some of the answers were fun, but they weren't realistic. So I said to them, that's not what they did. What they did was they invented the new big mouth tube, and they sold it to the American public. They said, if you squeeze this crap onto your toothbrush, you'll have foamier mouth and whiter teeth, and it's the newest thing on toothpaste. Everyone had to have it. Oh my god. Big mouth tubes flew off the shelves. Everyone had to have it. And that was creative, that was a creative idea. Didn't cost them, you know, make it a little bigger, you know? Pretty obvious when you think about it. It's like it was said earlier. When you hear the idea, it's go, damn, that was obvious. Why didn't I think of that? And my students said the same thing. Damn, why didn't I think of that, you know? So pattern thinking, we're all on the same tracks. Remember the runaway train? I didn't say the runaway train. Basically, what I wanted to say earlier is that <laughs> <laughs> It was my good line, too. We're all on this sort of runaway train to unfulfillment. In other words, we're, 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 we're zombie people leading McDonald's employee lives. And what I mean by that is, is that you know, we are muddled up with a lot of other people's thinkings, with societal norms. And so someone walks in, you know, yes, may I take your order? Why, thank you. Would you like some ketchup with that? That's fine. Are you pleased? Did I please you? Good. Thank you, sir. Hello. What's your name? Yeah, may I take, they don't ask your name. And you just basically, you're in a McDonald's, you live like a McDonald's employee. Yes, JR, what can I tell you? Yeah. Good idea, JR. What can I help you with? Yeah, I love that. No, I, you know, I just don't have any ideas. I don't, you know, we're, we don't know how to respond. We just know the patterns. And the, the train I was talking about afterwards was that it's a straight and narrow track. Uh, in, that off, in that boardroom with JR. And it's like everyone's thinking the same thing. Everyone's offering the same predictable patterned ideas. And that's what the track represents. Because everyone on the train is in the same zombie life that you're in. Because that's the culture of the organization and our society. So what you need to do is try to figure out a way to break that, to derail the tracks, or basically to go off on another curve, get off the straight and narrow. What do you do? This world is increasingly complex. It's crazy. Things are happening faster than, than any of us could ever possibly predict. So I have, I'm working with a company in Washington, and they, they, I'm going to do some visualization stuff. But I said, you know, I want to do a little bit of creative brainstorming te te techniques. And what I want you to do is, um, you know, set everybody up, and I'm going to, you know, so I'm going to treat, the, there are certain techniques we use, and when he wrote back saying, many of the people are uncomfortable with the creative brainstorming techniques because they're not artists, they don't know how to draw, and they're not artistic. And I said, you know, a, a survey, an IBM survey came out in 2010 asking 1,500 CEOs in 60 nations in 33 different industries what the most important quality of a new employee was, and they said create creativity to navigate an increasingly complex world. So I wrote that and I said, and I don't think they were looking for painters. So, so, so what can you do to start changing and breaking down that, chip, that block of concrete with all of the, I don't do anything outside my comfort zone. Turn those eyeballs inward, talked about that. Got to get it inward. In the corporate, in the, in the workplace, you've got to, You've got to start creating an environment, like just like I was saying with the home, where you're actually nurturing a, a, an environment of creativity and risk-taking and learning and, and that whole failure thing we've heard here before, that it's, it's failure is part of the process of discovery. 
Every academic I work with, every researcher knows that. It's just part of the process. Here, you're punished for failure. Bad. You failed. A, F, bad. I tell all my students, if you, get a, if you fail, do it again and I'll give you the better grade. Do it again and I'll give you an even better grade. I said, I'm not trying to screw you and fail you. I'm trying to teach you. And I want you to learn this stuff and come and see me. So, you know, if you imagine the creative process as sort of a Venn diagram with three circles, one is, one is you need a problem to solve. The second one is you need some creative environment to work in. And the third is you need knowledge, a base of knowledge. It has to be grounded. The, the, the answers have to be grounded in reality. So if you only have a problem to solve and knowledge and not the creativity, all you're going to get is a bunch of boring, predictable answers that aren't going to solve the problem. If you only have the problem in creativity but no knowledge, you're going to come up with unrealistic, stupid, dumb problems. One blog said that, you know, to, so, like, to drive, dramatize the point, you know, like if you take uh, a workplace, every, the noise in the workplace is disturbing everybody, what can we do? Well, cut off everybody's heads. If you cut off everybody's head, there will be no more noise in the workplace. But it's not a realistic solution based on knowledge. And if you only have the, the, the creativity and you have knowledge but no problem to solve, then you're some sort of a consultant looking for problems to solve. <laughs> Hello, I need problems. <laughs> but the sweet spot is right in the middle. All three of them are a beautiful thing. And so understanding that, you then apply that to the step-by-step -step brainstorming process for solving problems. And they're out there. Look at them up on the internet. There's seven steps, five steps, depending on who you talk to. I like four. One, define the problem. Make sure it's the, it's the right problem, too. Maybe you're going to say, how do we clean up the pollution in that stream? Maybe what you should be saying is, how do you move that factory that's polluting the stream out the way? Make sure the question you're asking is the right problem. That's, that, that's all full of research, investigation, really digging deep and make sure you're asking the right problem, because you can waste a lot of time trying to answer the wrong problem. Then you start ideating, you know? Divergent thinking. Throw ideas. The more the merrier at the problem. Writing on Post-its, you get everybody into a room, and everybody starts coming up with ideas. Not just Candy, candy cane man, everybody, because any idea as the big tooth mouth, mouth big tube, uh, toothpaste tube might have come because somebody wrote the word manhole on a piece of paper. And somebody said, oh my god, I've had an idea. That's called word association. So there are techniques. So there's divergent, come up with millions of ideas and paste them on a wall and move the post-its and get your team together, everybody talk, narrow it down, convergent to one or two ideas that you think you could try to really implement. Come to number three. Analytical thinking, tr critical thinking, tear that idea apart, rip it to shreds. That guy everybody calls negative in the, in the, at, the, at the company, negative, negative Dan, you know? That guy should be in there tearing that idea apart. Negativity is, is anybody who criticizes or, 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 or com negative person, bad, punish, reject. And then if that doesn't work, go back to square one and come up with more ideas. But if it does, move it on to implementation. That engineering dude who's got the bailing wire and the, and the duct tape, and he can make anything happen. I can make that happen. Many different disciplines. I'm really good with the ideating part, but I'm really, I score low on the other three. That's why you need a multidisciplinary team in there, not just candy cane man. So all of these things are important. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with is when you want to start thinking about changing yourself, you might want to consider applying those four steps to you. You know, what, are, what, are, what is my problem? What can I do about it? And how can, I, how can I change it? And then maybe you're not going to be the one asking yourself, you know, saying, I'm sorry to your five-year-old. OK, so I went on too long. I'm sorry. But this was about creativity. It was, I swear. <laughs> <laughs>